All right, for section 15.3, we are looking at uh, one more area of stats here called normal distribution. Uh, just to link it back to an old concept, uh, you guys remember this from previous lesson uh, when we did expected values. So in this case, if we were tossing a coin four times and we talked about uh, the probability of a head showing, um, this would be the, if we were, we used a tree diagram with this in an earlier lesson to demonstrate where these numbers came from, but these are the probabilities of getting uh, zero heads, or so this would be like the case of getting four tails in a row. That can only happen one out of the 16 times. Um, if we were going to say one head um, and the other three would be tails, there's four ways of that happening, uh, so on and so on. So two heads and two tails, uh, three heads, four heads. So if we, if we look at the spread of that data, you can see the largest probability is right there in the middle, um, and then it spreads out evenly to the left and to the right. And so if you were to use a bar diagram for that, you get this uh, kind of bell-shaped curve from that data. And so it's this bell-shaped curve that we're going to be working with for this section and to do normal distribution. Most of what you're going to be doing out of this is on your calculator. And so for the most part, you just have to know how to interpret a problem that they're giving to you and use it within your calculator. There is a small formula involved in this that is on your formula sheet, uh, but we don't use it a ton. It, it may come up in a couple scenarios, but most often we're going to be using Pure Calculator for this concept. So if we had, there, there's two ways to look at normal distribution. One is the standard normal distribution, and the other one is just normal distribution. In a standard normal case, uh, that is the case where you'd have a mean of zero. Mean is always the center of your graph right here. This is the mean of zero. So if you link that to this one right here, this was the mean outcome, and that was the center of the graph. And then a standard deviation of one. When you have a bell-shaped curve, you have your mean in the middle, and then you move to the left and to the right by standard deviations. So with a standard deviation of one, then I would be counting by ones to the left, and I would be counting by ones to the right, um, as far as move branching out from the mean within that curve. Keep in mind that when we did this in probability, um, the total of all of your possible scenarios always added up to one or a hundred percent. Same thing under the bell curve. Um, under this curve, you get a hundred percent of the probability or a total of one. Um, either way you look at it. So also something to keep in mind. So as we come down here, so uh, the first couple scenarios here, we are looking at the use of standard normal. So again, that's the one where you have a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. Um, and th these, so these will be your standard, standard normal problems. But even on these, even if we're using standard normal, uh, we're going to be doing this kind of thing in the calculator. So notice right here that we have a mean of zero and to the left, we have 0.6 standard deviations to the left and 1.5 standard deviations to the right. And we are trying to identify the area that you see shaded here under the curve. And remember, the area under the curve is the same thing as saying the probability of getting a value between this and this. So big connection here to probability. Uh, but this is all done in your calculator and you're seeing the steps right here. But let me pull it up for you really quick. Uh, so if you go into your calculator, um, right here under distribution is where we're going to find this one. Let me bring this down so you can see it. All right, so if you go right here under that distribution button that we've used in the past, so second distribution, um, and we're looking at these two options right here. So we're either going to be using normal CDF or inverse normal. These are the two buttons that we use for this section. Uh, so we have a, a cumulative area that we're referring to on this one. So we're using that normal CDF. They're going to ask you for four prompts, a lower bound and an upper bound. Um, and if you look at that curve that we were just showing here on the screen a second ago, the lower bound or what was on the left boundary of the lower side was at negative 0.6. The upper boundary was at 1.5. We have a mean of zero, a standard deviation of one. And if I just hit enter a couple times, this is the area under the curve. So 0.659 would be the area under that curve. And so that's all we have to do to put that into our calculator. Um, and that gave us the area under the curve or the probability of landing within this area of the curve. 
Uh, same thing if we're going to do something like this. So now they're talking about getting a value greater than 0.75. So they're looking for this area right here. So you can see the lower bound is 0.75. The upper bound is technically infinity because we are headed to the right forever. So let me show you real quick how to put infinity into your calculator. Um, so 0.75 to infinity. So if we go back to that same screen, so under distribution, normal CDF. So we were heading from uh, 0.75 towards infinity. And the way you put infinity in your calculator is there's a button right here that says EE. So this is technically scientific notation, but we are doing 1 second EE 99. That is like saying 1 times 10 to the 99th power. So basically infinity, really big giant number. Um, so if we just hit enter on that a few times, so that would be the area under that curve. Um, and so you can try this one if you want. So this would be, uh, so if we're going to talk about less than 0.75, uh, so this would be from negative infinity all the way up to 0.75. So your lower bound, you would put in negative 1 E99, and then your upper bound would be the 0 0.75. That's, that's for normal distribution when you're finding the area. Um, inverse normal is where they give you the area and you're trying to find a specific value, an x-axis value like this one is. Uh, so you'll notice on this one, they're telling us the result or the area below some number is 0 0.862. And so we have to figure out what that number would be. So in this case, if you, I'm going to go back into my calculator. So keep this area in mind of 0 0.862. So if I go back to my distribution button, so this is the one we're using inverse normal. So this is where they give you the area and you find a specific X value. So in this case, they want the area, which was the 0 0.8, whatever, 0 0.862. Keep in mind for area, when you're doing inverse normal, your calculator always wants the area to the left of the variable that you're trying to find. Um, so if you ever get the, the area to the right of your variable, you have to subtract that from 1 to put this number into your calculator. So this is the area below x on my calculator. And so there's my mean, there's my standard deviation, and that would be the x value. So 1.09 is the a value so same thing here so here's a case again where you are notice that they're telling you the area above a is 0.106 that's the area above a but when you go to put this in your calculator your calculator only interprets what is to the left of x and so you have to subtract this from one and put this number into your calculator for the area and so if you want to give that one a try that's just the same concept right there if you want a, another practice round on that when you do normal distribution normal distribution the only difference for this is your mean doesn't have to be zero and your standard deviation doesn't have to be one it can be any number um, the way these examples are shown is they actually teach you to use uh, the formula this is a formula on your formula packet and they want you to convert all of these into z scores so that you can use the standardized normal bell curve with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. But you don't have to do that. This is kind of an unnecessary step. Uh, your calculator can handle these numbers just the same. So uh, I'm going to show you kind of both ways, but I'll tell you which way I would do it. Um, so keep in mind just a little notation hint real quick. Uh, the way this is written, the first number is the mean. And this, technically, because of the square, is the variance. So I would have to square root this number to get my um, standard deviation. And that's what's going to happen on this one. So your mean is 40. Uh, if this is the variance, then the standard deviation would be 6. Uh, in this one, they just give you the standard deviation. So take a look. This one tells you that you have a mean of 80 and standard deviation of 5. And they are looking for the area under the curve less than 84. So you can see by this drawing what area that's referring to. So I need the, the area less than 84. So I can, in my calculator, just use these numbers. Um, if I wanted to use z-scores, so here's what that would look like. Remember, a z-score is simply 
how many standard deviations you are from the mean. So, and that's using this little formula right here. So if I were to look at 84, I'm four units away from the mean. Since my standard deviation is five, that means I am four-fifths of a standard deviation from the mean. Well, four-fifths is the same thing as 0.8. And so if I wanted to use z-scores, I would, I would be using this value of 0.8. Uh, so I'd be going from negative infinity to positive 0.8 with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. And that's the way you could do it with z-scores and standard normal curves. But you can use these numbers too. So keep this in mind. I, I got a mean of 80 and I want less than 84. So if I go back to my calculator here, so if I go back into distribution, normal CDF, so I got negative infinity. I'm going all the way up to 84. My mean was 80 and I had a standard deviation of 5 and so I can just use those numbers to get the area under the curve. I don't have to use z-scores but you can if you want to go that route. Um, same idea for this one so uh, this would be the exact same thing so if I just put these numbers into my calculator I'm gonna put this for the mean I'm gonna put this for the standard deviation this would be my lower bound this would be my upper bound and that's it. You just put in those numbers um, and, and you don't have to do any conversions like you see here. You can, but you don't have to. Uh, you can just put lower bound, upper bound, mean, standard deviation into your calculator and you'll get the same answer. Uh, so typically the way these come up are within word problem type scenarios like this one, uh, but you're just really doing the same thing we just showed. So in this case, they're giving you a mean of 124, standard deviation of 10. Um, somebody scored 140. So what proportion of scores were lower? That's a key word, lower than Helena's. So I'm looking for everything below 140. So, and again, you don't have to do this. You can if you want to, but you don't have to. You don't have to convert. Uh, just put in a mean of 124, a standard deviation of 10. And then you would be going from, your lower bound would be negative infinity your upper bound is 140 and that's going to give you this same result. Same thing that you're going to see right here. So again, feel free to pause this and try a couple of these on your own. Uh, but these are good sample questions right here. So same idea. They're always going to give you a mean, a standard deviation, a lower bound, and an upper bound. Just punch those directly into your calculator and you should come out with that same percent. Here's a case where um, you notice they're giving you the percent now. So this is where you would use the inverse normal feature. Uh, since they're giving you the percent and you are solving for a specific variable. So in this case, here's the mean, here's the standard deviation. Um, since they're talking about the 15th percentile, so they're saying the area below Z is 15%. So I'm going to put this in for the area, 0.15, and I'm going to get my value here. Uh, just a quick reminder on this one, um, because they're giving me 8% to the right, uh, this, is, this is referring to the top 8%. So because this is to the right, when I go to my inverse normal feature, the first prompt that says area wants to know this area right here. So I got to do 1 minus this, and I'm going to put 0.92 into my calculator for the area to get this Z value or this X value. This guy that you're seeing right here is really the only case where you really need the z-score formula. So take a look at this one. Um, right here, they're asking us to solve for standard deviation. Uh, so that's the change in the question on this. So they're giving us some specifics that you can read right here. Uh, but I need to find the z-score. Z is how many standard deviations away this is. And so that's what we're solving for. So if I do the inverse normal, with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one, and I put in this area, it's gonna give me the z-score, and that's where this is coming from, and now I can set it equal to my z-score formula and solve for the standard deviation. And so that's how we, you would use this one. Um, take a good look at that one. People often get hung up on this in a test scenario, so let me know if I can help any further on that one. Come on in. Uh, otherwise, try these last couple on your own. These are just some extra practice problems. Uh, but nothing different here than what we did up above.